Don't you think sexual liberation hurts women though in the end? So like women that sleep with more people have higher rates of depression. They're more likely to be on antidepressant drugs and the more people they sleep with, the less likely they are to have a happy marriage. Basically like when you, the more women are sleeping around, it's like a smaller percentage of men get to have sex with all the girls. And so it's like, you're basically a side chick. Because you, you get a lot of data from like dating apps. Yeah. So you can really see where who people are sleeping with. A lot of women think sexual liberation is the ability to be desired by men on the terms that men set. Now, that don't make, it don't make no sense. Women have very little idea of how much men do not like them. In January, a tall 25-year-old serial shadier in New York City became exhibitor for this claim. And also for men's defense against it. West Elm Caleb reportedly was intimate with a lot of women via dating apps and wasn't very honest with any of them about what he was doing. Then some of his dates compared notes via TikTok and the result caused so much arguing, it was even reported in India. Why all the noise about some two-bit Lothario in a city a long way away? Well, in one sense, this is as old as humans. The ongoing resonance of mythic figures such as Helen of Troy show we've been quarreling about men, women, and intimacy for a very long time. But the contours of the argument are also uniquely modern. It concerns a dream of weird freedom that blossomed in the mid-20th century, and that Gria herself helped to articulate. And it also captures the way that dream has soared in the hypermediated 21st century world. In the female eunuch, Gria argued that men have, since time immemorial, stuffed women into a domestic role in which they are treated variously as intimate objects a receptacle into which he has emptied his seed, a kind of human spittoon. In turn, she thought, women have internalized a stunted image of our own desires. While our bodies are different, supposedly immutable differences in our inner lives are really imposed by stereotype. And this stereotype serves to castrate women, replacing a fully engaged and emancipated female energy with a weak and artificial femininity. Greer argued that women should abandon this self-imposed prison, Instead, it should pursue revolution, meaning the freedom to be a person with the dignity, integrity, nobility, passion, and pride that constitute personhood. Five decades later, how is Greer's vision working out? Well, the Anglosphere rejection of suburban domesticity and motherhood is now advanced. The average age of marriage has been rising steadily since the 70s, while the total number of marriages has declined steadily. Over the same period, birth rates in the US and UK have fallen steadily and are currently at their lowest ever level. Childbearing was never intended by biology as a compensation for neglecting all other forms of fulfillment and achievement. And now that women have more choices, they're voting with their feet, or perhaps, wombs. So Greer's vision of swapping compulsory domesticity for greater female choice, self-realization and empowerment has been realized at least for some. But how far did she really swim against the tide in setting this out? When the female unit rocketed Gria to international fame, the Anglosphere had already seen a decade of counterculture, centered on the rejection of tradition and the pursuit of freedom and desire. And one crucial text for this was Jack Kerouac's On the Road in 1957, a book that celebrated the freewheeling pursuit of passion over the humdrum every day. The central character, Dean Moriarty, is a drifter, a slacker, and a hedonist. He floats from place to place, leaving a trail of unpaid debts, disappointed friends, damaged cars, and chaos in his wake. He's also a prolific and faithless shagger, taking up with lover after lover before abandoning them. In Kerouac's telling, Moriarty is depicted both as a walking disaster zone, but also an ecstatic spiritual figure. Far from being abusive, his womanizing seems animated by an intense desire to drink deeply from the cup of life, love, and desire. For her vision of revolution also involves women becoming more Dean Moriarty-like women, she claimed, are not by nature monogamous. Rather, we should be deliberately promiscuous, reject domesticity as an attitude of impotence and hatred, masquerading as tranquility and love, and run away. But footloose emancipation on the Greer and Kerouac model has not been cost-free. Greer, the libertarian, argued that what gets called assault is mostly just bad intimacy and shouldn't be severely punished. 
But the angry and aggrieved women of the Me Too era seem far from her breezy confidence that bad intimacy should simply be shrugged off, especially where it feels coercive. We're witnessing a steady re-evaluation of past attitudes to female liberation too. It turned out, in practice, that no sooner was intimacy liberated from reproduction than it was reordered to commerce and enterprises such as the Playboy adult content empire. Despite Greer's approval of this development, Playboy was for decades a byword for egalitarian, libertine, and commercialized empowerment. Now a recent documentary has compiled allegations of abuse and even bestiality by dozens of the playmates Hugh Hefner brought to live in his mansion. It turns out that the brave new world of free agency and personal responsibility can mesh uncomfortably with real-world imbalances, whether of power, money, or beauty. Meanwhile, the female emancipation Greer pursued has delivered a bonanza for every live-in-the-moment modern-day women with the looks to enjoy it. In the world of online dating, intimacy is even more abundant than it was for Dean Moriarty. Photogenic male friends find female attention so abundant that some are quite sick of the attention. But not everyone lucks out. Among those neither married or possessing the charms to game online dating, intimacy access may be difficult to come by. And among these involuntarily celibate men, this uneven liberation has spurred a boiling rage, much of which is directed against women. Over on the other side too, it's the other team's fault, every woman exploited in a Me Too situation or running afoul of some other amorous asymmetry, points the finger at patriarchy for her distress. But the common factor in both cases is a culture in hoc to the libertarianism of Kerouac and Greer. For while this worldview was lionized as freedom, in practice, what it delivered was a kind of marketization of the heart that imagines we can love according to principles of rational choice and utility maximization. Rooted in mid-century liberation, this paradigm powers much of the hostility between the genders today. When a man claims that we shouldn't empathize with Hefner's bunnies as they were adult women who should have known what they were getting into, that's not misogyny. It's just what it looks like when you apply the market logic of freedom and personal responsibility to intimacy. The same market logic suffuses the manosphere fixation on amorous market value and concludes that West Elm Cad did nothing wrong. For in market terms, we're all independent, rational adults. On the other side of the ledger, we find the same mindset in the women who share first aid evaluation spreadsheets with their friends. In the supposedly feminist claim that amorous work is work, or in the big assertion that all men cheat, so you might as well hold out for a rich cheater, or the claim that men's loneliness is men's fault, for male loneliness is caused only by a surplus of high-value women and a surplus of low-value men. Instead of questioning a moral market liberalism, all we're offered to make sense of this mess is a schizophrenic feminism wholly enthralled to the same fixation on autonomy, but only for women. This worldview celebrates Greer's radical autonomy and a moral permissiveness. While dismissing observable normative differences between the genders as stereotypes and blaming any negative side effects of this approach on patriarchal revanchism. Beneath this officially sanctioned surface, meanwhile, lurks an increasingly embittered male resentment that reacts with gleeful schadenfreude whenever a woman acknowledges that there can be trade-offs between female empowerment and motherhood. Yet, neither side is willing to see the field of courtship as anything more than a low-trust, radically individualist, structurally impermanent market. A grim perspective, both reinforced and accelerated by the dating apps that now dominate courtship, under that cloud of suspicion and impermanence, it's easy to see how the prospect of an 18-year commitment to a dependent child, and hopefully also to his or her other parent, might well seem wildly implausible or just unattainable. Where autonomy conquers solidarity, children are psychologically and increasingly literally inconceivable. But it's precisely when we get to children that the persistent asymmetry between the genders becomes most difficult to deny as poignantly illustrated by the lives of both Greer and Kerouac themselves. Kerouac is an object lesson in the wider shockwaves caused when men refuse to move on from amoral hedonism. He married three times and only grudgingly paid child support for Jan, the daughter he fathered in his eight-month marriage to Joan Haverty after a paternity test. 
He met his daughter only twice. Her life was marked by poverty, trauma, drug taking, and finally death at 44. Greer, meanwhile, never had children. Her biographer recounts how she struggled and failed to do so before eventually taking solace in her animals. Team Kerouac and Team Greer are both really the same camp. But depending on your gender, the costs of liberation are inescapably different. And if we just point fingers at the other side's selfishness, we miss the deeper truth that beneath the pervasive turn of cynicism are real humans. And no matter how loudly disappointment curdles to bitterness, nearly all in truth still long for intimacy, companionship, and in most cases, kids. Such a craving for solidarity is now nigh on impossible to square with contemporary norms or social infrastructure. Hard as it may be to admit, this is not the exclusive fault of one gender or the other. And yet compassion for the opposite gender's predicament is ever more difficult to muster. What are your thoughts? Tell us down in the comment section. Remember to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.